Dr. Freer Hinsey is professor and chair of the Department of Theology at Fordham University. She served as director of the Francis and Anne Curran Center for American Catholic Studies from 2010 to 2020. She holds an MA from the Catholic University of America and a PhD from the University of Chicago. Dr. Fear Hinsey's research focuses on foundational and applied issues in Christian social ethics, with particular interest in the dynamics of social transformation, Catholic social thought, and economic and work justice for vulnerable women, families, and groups. Dr. Fear Hinsey's scholarly articles have appeared in Theological Studies, the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics, the Journal of Catholic Social Thought, and Studies in Christian Ethics. She is the author of a number of books, including Glass Ceilings, Dirt Floors, Women, Work, and the Global Economy, and Radical Sufficiency, Work, Livelihood, and a U.S. Catholic Economic Ethic. At the conclusion of our talk, there will be time for some questions. Please help me to welcome Dr. Fira Hinzi as she addresses the topic, Enough for All, the Radical Vision of Modern Catholic Teaching on Economy and Work. Thank you for that very nice introduction, and thank you for being here. It's a real pleasure and honor to be with you all tonight. Um, I've been very excited about coming up here ever since I got the invitation. Uh, you are a, a group of people who are going to be in the world and do wonderful things, and so it's wonderful to get to share some of the thoughts and research I've, I've, I, I have to share with you tonight based on uh, many years of homework, um, studying these issues, and also based most recently on the book cover that you see there, um, which literally is the result of about 25 years of homework and raising kids and putting it down and picking it up and putting it down. So um, I was delighted to have it finally come out from Georgetown this, this year and also delighted to be able to share some of this with you. Um, everything. No matter what topics we care about, um, they link to the economy, and they link, and work is something that everybody deals with in their lives. So, um, even though there's many other topics we could talk about tonight, I'm confident that this topic uh, touches in some deep ways on everyone's life. Um, and as an ethicist, where the rubber meets the road, actually caring about how people's lives either get changed or get better or get worse um, because of religious communities is absolutely at the heart of my interests and maybe some of yours as well. So tonight, um, I want to talk about Catholic social thought, Catholic social teaching, and some of you may feel like I, I've heard of that before. I know what that is, right? Some of you, some people are nodding. So we'll just do a little bit of an overview of that, but it's all toward an end of, of, of talking more deeply about what is a Catholic perspective, particularly a modern Catholic perspective on the economy like? How does it compare and contrast to the way we in the uh, dominant Western world think about economics and think about work? And what might people who are formed in a Catholic social view of the economy have to offer to the pressing problems and the deep changes that our world is going through right now, that we're in the thick of right now? So in, the, in this book, um, and notice the word radical, okay? Um, it's not often that I think of religion as being that radical. Growing up Catholic, I didn't think it was that radical. Um, however, um, it's, there's something about going to the roots of life. There's something about going down to the foundational things of life that philosophers do and that faith people do. And so that's kind of the direction that the term radical points to. It also has to do with um, the kind of critique that we make of the status quo and also the kind of vision for wholeness that a faith community has. Um, I would argue that both of those are radical in the sense that they want to go to the roots of human life and also they want to talk about the fullness of what human life can be, even as faith traditions are very, also very um, uh, realistic and sober about things like evil and sin and brokenness. And so what we get from a religious tradition is a worldview that at its best hopes, helps us to illuminate but also navigate this deeper level um, with all the good and with all the light and the darkness and the, and the hope and the, and, the, and the fear and hopefully not the despair. 
So in my own work, I've focused on the United States over the last century or so, and how the Catholic social tradition, which starts in the late 1890s, the modern Catholic social tradition, has talked about economics. And one of the figures in the book is Monsignor John A. Ryan. Uh, there's a picture there. He taught at Catholic U many years. He was an economist and a priest. He was a public figure, a public intellectual, and he was very well known um, during his lifetime. He was on the cover of Life magazine or Time magazine and so forth. He was an advisor to FDR, so a pretty big deal for a Catholic priest at that time. And one of the lines in his own corpus is he once privately said to his sister, because he, he, he advised the bishops, so you don't talk up to the bishops about anything radical, right? And he, so he said to his sister, who happened to be a nun, um, I actually think that you know the vision that I'm trying to help lay out here about Catholic social teaching is sufficiently radical. I hope it is, I hope it is. And in the book that I've just finished now, I basically want to argue that today, yes, that's true, but we need a vision today that is actually focused on what I'm calling radical sufficiency. And what do I mean by that? Um, basically, by radical sufficiency, I'm referring to the belief that the economy's purpose is to ensure access to a dignified livelihood for every person, household, and family. So an inclusive view of what the purpose of, of an economy is. And radical sufficiency also refers to the personal, spiritual, cultural, and policy mindsets and actions and viewpoints you need to advance this inclusive livelihood economic order, which also has to be ecologically sustainable. So that's a tall order. Um, but I think this vision of enough for all. So it, from this point of view, then, um, there's a um, agenda that's grounded in US Catholic, or I should say a US Catholic version of Catholic social thought um, that focuses on a certain way of understanding work, livelihood, and economic life. Now, the background to this is something that many of you are familiar with, I'm sure, and that is the beginnings of Catholic social thought. I should say the beginnings of modern Catholic social teaching coming from the papacy. There's been Catholic social thought since the New Testament. This is a specific uh, dimension of that in the modern period. Um, was the church in the 19th century looking around and saying, we have to be able to address what they called in those days the social question? And by that they meant, the impacts of modern industrializing economy on vulnerable working families. Um, you know about 19th century Europe and the way children and women and men were mistreated. Um, and by the way, the focus of Catholic social teaching on the economy and my own focus is generally on non-elites, on working class families, on working poor families. Um, obviously, many times, who gets to hear these kinds of lectures or read these books? We tend to be elites in some way, shape, or form. We're very lucky to be here right now, right? But the focus of the tradition is on the more vulnerable folks um, and the everyday folks, the ordinary folks. And this was true um, from the late 19th century. The workers was the focus. Whoops. This goes back to going the right way. All right, there we go. And so what we find in 1891 forward, starting with Pope Leo, who's waving at you down there in the lower left, uh, is that popes begin to speak out in systematically thoughtful ways about social, political, economic issues. But the nub of it is really economic. It was the economic plight of these people that, that really was the spark for modern Catholic social teaching. And then this continues in 1931 with Pope Pius XI, who's in the middle of the Depression and the rise of Nazism and, and fascism, um, who comes out with a, with a document 40 years after. It goes on all the way into the 20th and 21st century with Benedict and Francis. Um, and again, a constant set of messages about economies are for people. Economies should serve everyone inclusively. People should have dignified livelihoods based on reasonable amounts of work and, and rights to, to have time for their family and so forth and so on. One thing about Catholic social teachings discourse is that it aims to speak about human and economic, not just values, not just values, of course it does talk about values, but also about the way things really are, realities and truths. And the effort here is to engage not just Christians, but 
the term is often used, all people of goodwill. Anyone who's open to figuring out what's true or cares about what's good or is working for the betterment of human beings, this discourse aims to speak to and engage those folks. Um, I have, this is a quote from, um, uh, oh, who's this famous guy here? Who's, the, who's this guy? The, the, Yes, thank you, Tyson, right. Um, I love this quote, it's from, it's a, he's talking about the climate change issue, right? The good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. Um, and I wanna say that the Catholic discourse on society and economics is also making a similar claim. We're not just saying, oh, it would be really nice if the economy ser should serve people. No, economy should serve people. That's why people make economies, right? So th these are claims about reality, not just about values or ideals, is my point. And also based in and drawing on the best science of the day to make the arguments, which is also a very interesting thing. You can see this in Thomas Aquinas going all the back to way back to the Middle Ages. So this idea that reason and faith should be in partnership as you talk about these issues is really key here. So there are some foundational principles that I'm gonna talk more about each of these very briefly, and you've heard these before probably. Huh? The God-given dignity of every person, a relational anthropology, the common good, justice as empowerment and participation for all, solidarity in a preferential, sometimes costly option for the poor and vulnerable and marginalized, and that care for creation and care for vulnerable peoples goes hand in hand, or go hand in hand. Uh, I have the problem of someone who wrote a really long book and it's like, oh, I wanna tell you everything that I wrote about, but I can't. So I'm just gonna swing by these things and say, I know you've heard about some of these before, but we wanna keep in mind, how is this different than the way we as Americans, particularly as US people, are taught to think about the world? This notion of the common good, everything is related, is key to Catholic social and economic thought. And uh, the ultimate common good for, for believers is God. That's what we all share in common. The good we all share in common is the divine, whether we're believers or not. Uh, there are communal goods, tr cultures and traditions, and then personal goods, which are individual things that are just mine, but that's always in the, in the context of, these, of a, larger, whoops, a larger understanding of sort of a nested or an interrelated view of society and community. So I'm never just an isolated person. Um, I'm always a, a very dignified individual, but always in the midst of these relationships. Government has a role to make sure that this common good is served, but also to ensure the rights of individuals are taken care of in this way of thinking about things. Um, it's not an individual is always over society view, but it's not a society is over, over individual view all the time either. It's, it, it attempts to try to talk about flourishing with, of individuals and persons within society. At the very same time, it's not Pollyanna-ish, this, this way of looking at things. Um, there's a realism here about human fallibility, sinfulness, and the structural and personal intergenerational effects. So original sin passed down over generations gets interpreted as in terms of structures, in ter terms of systems, in terms of ideologies, racism immediately comes to mind. Um, that have all these ripple effects, right, that we inherit and that we will probably go to our dying grave and not have solved completely. This idea of we live in a broken world. And so everything we try to do to make it better, um, it, there's a realism about that, that we can't fix the broken world completely and yet we're called to address it. Solidarity, that kind of just going down the list I gave you earlier. Solidarity in this, in this, in this uh, body of thought, especially John Paul II, he says solidarity is the firm and enduring commitment to the common good, to take an attitude that says I care about and will serve the common good, uh, and I will connect with other people deliberately based on my interconnections that are already there. This is the antidote, the potential um, cure, not completely, to the common bads, to the broken common bads of structural sins and structural issues. So again, what is solidarity? It's a mindset, it's a moral virtue, and it's a Christian virtue. Uh, mindset, I recognize interdependence. Moral virtue, I respond to that interdependence. I say, okay, I'm gonna act as if I really am connected to other people. <laughs> um, I'm gonna actually take responsibility. Um, those two things 
any human being can do. For Christians, there's a third element, which is seeing all this theologically, responding out of love for God and neighbor uh, to my interdependence, being willing to give myself for the neighbor and sacrifice myself for the neighbor. Now, we know that there are non-believers who sacrifice themselves for the neighbor, right? Who give themselves in the full measure. So uh, I, in one way, the Christian is naming something that we see in other people who may, not, who may be other faiths and so forth and so on. In order to make sure that solidarity does its work correctly in a broken world, it needs to be biased in a certain way toward those who are most vulnerable, those who may be left out, those who are marginalized. And there's a few examples in the pictures there, huh? Um, including um, an option for a vulnerable earth. So we have to make a preferential option, Francis focuses on this in particular, um, to a vulnerable earth um, for Francis and now this tradition um, very firmly in, in this period, solidarity and sustainability have to go hand in hand. It can't just be the cry of the earth or the cry of the poor, it's gotta be both together. This is a quote from Francis, everything is interconnected and genuine care for our own lives and relationships with nature are inseparable from brotherhood and sisterhood, justice and faithfulness to others. Now let's move more particularly into uh, Catholic social thoughts, uh, faith-informed social economic approach to economy. I had up here earlier and I changed it, a heterodox approach. And by that I'm trying to signal the fact that there's an orthodoxy of economic thinking that most of us have imbibed as part of the Northern, you know, uh, Northern uh, global culture um, that you learn in Econ 101. Um, and that's what we would consider mainstream orthodoxy. This is a view of economics and economy that isn't simply ideals and values. It actually is grounded in other kinds of economic thinking, which, which are sometimes called um, social economic views or heterodox economic views. Um, those are often terms that are used for this. So this is not unconnected to economic thinking is my point, to economic science. It, there are different threads or strands of economic science that are being pulled here. First of all, um, this approach emphasizes economy's classical meaning and purpose. That's something you would see in the early Greek meaning of the term oikonomia, which comes from the term household, right? So originally economy was the tending to the needs of the members of the household, the material needs of the household. Um, but the notion of inclusive provisioning, making sure everyone has enough, Surprisingly, perhaps, that's exactly how Adam Smith describes the purpose of economy. One wouldn't think that from the way he's talked about today. Uh, but the purpose of an economy is make sure that the members are provisioned. Um, that's the first purpose of it for him as well. What is the economy's purpose? To produce and make accessible ample sufficiency, in other words, enough for all the members. Now we can argue about who's the members, right? Who gets, who's in, who's out. But this notion is a very foundational and notice it's not simply distributing scarce goods in a situation of endless preferences, which is what the orthodox way of talking about economics usually is. Um, this view would say, you can talk about that thing, distributing in the face of scarcity, but it should be against the backdrop of, and always with the priority of, the purpose is to make sure everybody has enough. So I'm gonna just mention four base points in this view of economics and work. First of all, political and economic institutions exist to serve people inclusively. Um, and that's why they're even there. And I won't read all these quotes. This is a quote from, um, from Francis. But every economic action must provide each inhabitant of the planet with the minimum wherewithal to live in dignity and freedom, the possibility of supporting a family, educating children, praising God, and developing one's human potential. That's a great summary of the Catholic view of what an economy is supposed to be able to make possible for people. This goes against our modern dominant consumerist market culture. To say that we're talking about enough for everybody economy is really different from the you're on your own. I was so happy to see this yo-yo. I'd never seen it before. This is so cute, right? You're on your own. Yo-yo. It's up to you. You've got to do it. 
Uh, there's a gentleman here tonight who asked what I was speaking about, and I said something, I said about how, how to have an economy where everybody has enough. And he said, laughingly, he says, oh, you, get, give me $5 million. That was his joking response. But that is how we respond. I would have enough if I personally had $5 million, right? Because um, I'm on my own. I can't expect anyone else to help me in this economy. Um, the other thing about a consumerist culture is we don't know where enough starts. We never feel like we have enough. We never, our restless hearts, it's like the Hobbesian world, right? Of uh, the seeking of power after power restlessly that ceases only in death. That's how Hobbes describes the state of nature. Well, there's a certain way in which we're culturated to feel that way, right? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the new thing? Do I have enough? No, I don't. You know, what if, what if, what if? I'm not quite secure yet. I can't give you that because what if I need it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I believe we are deeply, deeply formed in that consumerist way of thinking and being. And so this is very different from um, this idea that everything we do economically should be for this purpose, to make sure everybody has enough. A second base point, dignified participation and provisioning for everyone are the prime metrics for measuring an economy's success. What is a well-functioning economy? Everybody has a chance to participate, Everybody has access to enough. Those are the metrics, not the GDP, not, not you know, all those things are good, but they're sub, subservient to this bigger thing, okay? Third base point, in a properly functioning economy, all members have access to dignified work that yields at minimum living wages. It's interesting how that term has burst back onto the scene in the last 20 years in this country and even more recently, and a decent livelihood. And by 4S, um, I'm referring to some terminology that old John A. Ryan used to use that I still think is really evocative. He says that complete worker justice requires that for a reasonable amount of labor, people should, should, should ha have access to a decent livelihood that's marked by, he said three things, sufficiency, enough money to support yourself and your family, Security through benefits and um, insurance and uh, policy against the vulnerabilities of illness, old age, calamity, and so forth. And status, status through agency, voice, and profit sharing in the workplace and in civic life and associ associational life. Um, today we would add sustainability physical sustainability, social sustainability, and ecological sustainability. So a system that doesn't pay attention to the last S is not gonna get as far as it should with the first three. What I find so interesting about these three things is they are also very psychological and even spiritual elements of our own experience of living, right? Um, feeling like I have enough. I don't, that to me is not a, something I feel here, I feel it here. I, I don't have enough, I might not have enough. You know, That's a very visceral feeling. I'm probably very adaptive, right? That we have to be aware of that as human animals. What does it mean to be secure? You know, Again, or insecure. And thirdly, what does it mean to have status, to have dignity, to have people see me as a worthwhile person? I suspect, at least my experience is that I think I, I go through those things every day. You know, uh, I'm always trying to negotiate those things every single day. So he's talking about it in an economic sense, but I think we can think of it more broadly than that as well. So this idea of dignified participation in work should yield a dignified livelihood. And the pictures I have here suggest that we aren't just talking about paid work, although that's obviously important. But through the work we do in the domestic home economy, around the household, in the neighborhood, as well as at the workplace, all together should create a livelihood, a good livelihood for all. This is another problem with modern economic orthodoxy. It only measures the workplace and the money part of work and livelihood, right? When we all know, and this has come out a lot during the pandemic, that there's a whole world of work going on behind the scenes of the person who walks out that door and goes into the workplace every day, right? And when, when they imploded on one another, when they all of a sudden were collapsed on one another in the homes, right, during COVID, all of a sudden people are saying, well, wait, there's this whole care economy. There's just all this care work that's being 
being done. Nobody noticed it before. Uh, no, it's always been there. <laughs> and those doing it have been quite aware of it. It's generally been assigned to women oftentimes, the unpaid care work of the home, at least primarily. They are, women have traditionally and even today been the CEOs of the care economy. And even the paid jobs that are care jobs are often overpopulated by women. And there's a whole conversation that we could have about that. But the key point here is this Catholic view sees work as a fundamental aspect of human dignity. That's very interesting. You know, um, it's not the only aspect, but the idea that um, being able to do something constructive, whether it's wash the dishes <laughs> at home or work in the office, et cetera, is part of feeling like I'm a full human person, even if I'm very limited in what I can do. The fourth base point. How do we live into this way of looking at the, uh, the economy, rather than just an abstract set of ideas? It requires, I argue, and I'm getting this from, from this literature, practices of solidarity and practices of sufficiency. In other words, cultivating an attitude and a practice that acknowledges your connections with others and tries to work for the common good. And then secondly, cultivating an attitude and practices that orient you toward enough. That to me, again, very challenging for me um, as an American, <laughs> as an American economic uh, you know, uh, product. Uh, um, these, these two practices are keys to building just sustainable political economies. And again, Francis talks about this at great length, but you could see it throughout the tradition. So in sum, I'm really suggesting that we have two very, very well-formed economic paradigms that are in tension here. And as Catholics in the United States or in the West, um, we kind of stand in that tension. The dominant orthodoxy focuses on abstract, atomized homo economicus. Again, those of you who have taken Econ 101 recognize this, right? The individual self-maximizer. That's what you assume when you're doing your basic economic uh, equations. Um, the CST view, the social economic view, focuses on embodied interrelated homo solidaritas. We're already connected. We already um, are interrelated. Private preferences on the one side, the common good on the other side. Notice the common good does not eliminate private pre uh, preference, but it places it in a larger context. Individual freedom and effort versus solidarity and option for the poor. Again, one does not subsume the other, but which one takes priority? Markets operate autonomously versus markets embedded in a complex legal social eco ecology. So someone like Polanyi, if you're familiar with Karl Polanyi, this idea of the embeddedness of the economy and the society is a very Catholic view as well. Minimal governor re government re regulations uh, will let markets succeed from the orthodox view. <clears throat> Active government for common good is the way that we find the Catholic view um, argu arguing. Now, when I say the Catholic view, I want to keep reminding you, it isn't just Catholics who think this. Of course, there's, not, there's a lot of Catholics who don't think this, right? Um, but um, this isn't just a Catholic view. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. <coughs> so going back to this idea, <coughs> I apologize. So what is radical sufficiency? The belief that Economy's purpose is to serve, give it, make sure everyone has participation and a dignified livelihood. <coughs> and there's kind of a radical sufficiency orientation that persons, communities, policies, and so forth need if this is going to be forward. <coughs> One of my favorite comics here. For those of us formed by market consumerist orthodoxy, moving in this direction is going to require change. Per potentially costly change. I love this, you know, who wants change? Yes, we want change. Who wants to change? Oh, well, no, not really. Um, um, you know, climate, address the climate crisis now. You know, well, what is that supposed to mean? Do I, not, do I have to give up my air conditioner? Oh, no, I don't think so. Right. Um, 
So it's not easy. We can laugh, but we know it's true in ourselves, right? We don't want to really change. Um, why? Because we're insecure, we feel we're worried about insufficiency, and we don't want to lose our status, going back to those three S's, right? We, want, we know we have a certain amount of it right now, and we're afraid if we change, we might lose it, right? Those who are poor and marginalized have less to lose, and so are often more, often more insightful and open in practicing of these very virtues that we need to, as moral elite people, take on. So to walk the talk of this uh, humanistic and Catholic economic vision is going to re require of us, I believe, root level reorientations. In other words, and the popes talk about this, we need conversion. We need conversion, to use that religious word. Some of you may be familiar with the Jesuit theologian and philosopher Bernard Lonergan, who writes a lot about conversion, um, really great stuff. He says that conversion is a shift of one's fundamental orientation and about face from self-enclosure to self-transcendence, from centering on the self, what am I gonna lose, what about me, blah, 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 to opening up to self-transcendence, connection with others, what might it mean to live in community, et cetera. Um, he's, again, reflecting on something you find in scripture. What's the thing that Jesus said when he came into every town? He didn't say, I'm about to name the Pope and it's Peter. No, he didn't say that. You know, he didn't say, follow all the commandments or you're in trouble, you know. But what did he say? He said, repent, in other words, change your life. We, we translate it repent, but it's really turn your life around. Shuv is the, is the Hebrew word. Turn your life around because God's way of doing things is at hand. So this idea of turning ourselves around with the grace and help of God and other people. <clears throat> I'm using Lonergan's thinking here. He says, conversion alters the horizons of your knowing and caring. So you can have intellectual conversion when you go over the edge of what you knew before and all of a sudden you see a whole new level like arithmetic to calculus and you go, oh, wow. I'm at a whole new level here. You know, I now, I, I don't give up on arithmetic, but now I see something different. So, it, so you can have a leap forward or something that opens your horizons intellectually, morally. I never really thought of the homeless before, and now I see them, and now I can't go back. Okay, a moral, and then um, uh, affective or religious, um, and it's interesting that, uh, that uh, this is something that Lonergan and other, other uh, Theologians suggest it's like an opening or unclenching of your mind, your heart, um, your spirit that some theologians compare to falling and being in love. So the idea for Lonergan of uh, faith is falling in love with the divine and then dwelling in love with the divine. And so it's such a fascinating image, right? Because is that, do you do that on purpose? Can you make that happen? You know, falling in love is a really mysterious thing, right? But that's going over the edge into something new, a new way of being, right? And that can happen intellectually, morally, and spiritually and religiously. So this is a way of looking at the world, and I actually think this is, this is at the heart of what a good liberal arts education should be doing for all of us, which is to convert us to truth or to a love for reality and not to settle for less. The drive to discover and honor what is true, that's intellectual conversion. All of you know it, all of you are engaged in that as students and faculty. Moral conversion, conversion to value, drive to discover and follow what is really good, not just what is convenient, not just what my interest is, but what's really the right or good thing to do here. And then conversion, affective or religious, to conversion to love, conversion to love what's truly good, and for believers, it's also conversion to the divine. This is a multifaceted and continually ongoing process, so it's not like you do it once, it's like what you do with your whole life. And I would argue that you know the benefit of a deeper education, a higher education, um, at its best, it teaches you the habits of conversion, understood like this, so that you're always going to be learning and getting larger in your horizon as you go through life. If we need solidarity and sufficiency, 
as practices in order to get to a radical sufficiency economy. And by the way, we're speaking in the, in the backdrop of Glasgow right now, right? Um, the climate problem, the climate issue. We're speaking in the backdrop of Black Lives Matter right now. And the incredible, I would say, conversions that, that people have had, not everybody, but there have been conversions in our society about some of these things. We badly need more of a conversion on the ecological front, right? So we're in moments right now where a lot of this is pressing on people and, and communities. But most deeply, I believe, and I think this tradition argues as well, that this is a path of spiritual conversion. So becoming a person of solidarity and sufficiency isn't just something I grit my teeth and do. It's not just a moral decision or intellectual decision, but it's, it's, a, it's a path of changing my heart, my spiritual orientation. And so I was delighted to see that we have a certain fantastic imagery of Psalm 23 up here on the wall, which I've never seen before. It's very cool, very abstract. But this idea that where do I find my security, my sufficiency, and my status? Do I find it in money? Do I find it in being careful? Do I find it in putting you know, my IRA and so forth? Or for a believer, can I let go of that and unclench myself and be open to other ways of approaching that? So this idea of unclenching, opening up to a different kind of sufficiency, security, and status. Now, I could have a little quiz here and see who went to Mass. If you went to Mass, you recognize these two fantastic biblically, biblical women that we heard about today in the scripture. Um, the widow of, oh, it begins with a Z. What is it called? The widow of Z. -Z, -Z, -Z. Zerabeth, thank you. And that's um, Elijah saying to the widow of Zerabeth, um, I need you to make me some food. And she's saying, see these sticks? I was about to make a fire because I'm out of food and I'm going to make dinner for my kid and me and then we're going to starve. Um, and so of all the pictures, I love, this, I love this picture because most of them are her serving Elijah and the kids there smiling. It's like, no, this is like the end of her food. And he's saying, trust God, don't worry, there'll be enough, right? Uh, but she had to make a decision. She had to make a decision. And she could easily and rightfully have said, no way, buddy, you know, this is my last meal and you're telling me to give up my last meal for my kid, for you? Uh, but she didn't, she unclenched, she had the grace to say, you know, I'll do this. And of course, as the story goes, the, the, there's always enough. It doesn't go away, right? She, she maintains enough. Over here, we've got the widow's mite, right? She's giving her last bit where all these fat cats are giving some of their stuff, right? And Jesus points her out and says she's the one who represents the kingdom of God. So we have in our spiritual tradition this call to unclench, to take a risk, etc. Does that mean um, we should, you know, give up everything we have and go sit in the street? No, it's not as easy as that almost, you know, it's more complicated than that. But how do we orient ourselves in the ways that these very, very courageous, poor women did and do every day. They take risks that are incredibly beyond anything that we feel like we can do on a daily basis. In a way, when we talk about a church of and for the poor, the, church, the poor have so much to teach that we, the more comfortable, need to learn. Okay, but how? All right, so this is all nice, but how are we really supposed to do this, right? How can we, in our personal, actual lives, uh, uh, do our parts to promote radical sufficiency? In other words, do our parts to promote humanly and ecologically sustainable practices and policies and economies where dignified lives and livelihoods are available to all. Some of you may go into the policy world. Some of you may go into the service professions, social work, et cetera. Some of you may go into teaching. There's different ways in which this can happen. Underlying that is, the, is our own personal orientation to this as well, um, maybe the hardest part in some ways. So for one thing, this whole conversion thing is not like this nice little, you know, little smooth running thing like the earlier chart showed, right? It's ongoing, bumpy, circuitous, uncertain and messy to try to move in a direction of change like this. It always has been, <laughs> it is now, it always will be. In our consumerist society, we are then told, well, it's too hard, it's too complicated, so therefore I really can't do anything except go look at Amazon. You know, that's really what I'll do. Or I'll play a video game that, because it's just too much for me. I just can't deal with it, right? And we're really seduced that way. You know, it's just too complicated, can't do it. Hey, it's always been complicated. 
<laughs> it's always been hard. It's always been unsure whether things would be successful. We forget that. When women fought for suffrage, they didn't know if they'd win. When Martin Luther King did his thing, he didn't know if he would win. You know, but it's because people tried and tried and tried over generations that change happens. It takes courage, though, and it takes uh, persistence. And so in order to have that, we need people and we need communities uh, around us who are dedicated to ongoing conversion and common action. Um, whether it's in actual, and they're in the background, I've got Glasgow there for you, um, whether it's in actually coming out and protesting and resisting, uh, or it's in the quieter ways of how you re raise your children or what you do in your neighborhood, there's many, many ways to do this. But finding the people in the communities that do care about ongoing conversion, whether they ever use those words or not, and common action to make things better. That's what we need to seek out. That's what we need to try to surround ourselves with. It's not easy and it's a long journey and this is what King called the beloved community. You know, you need the community and on its best days, the church can be that, you know, um, but it happens elsewhere as well. So well, just to end here um, th with sort of the encouragement to myself as much as anybody else that, um, that there is something for me to do and it's different for every single person in this room, um, but that as communities of faith in particular, we wanna encourage each other to discern what it is we can do and to support one another in doing that. Um, I love the Arthur Ashe quote along those lines, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Um, and it might be something tiny and little, it might be not be anything on a given day, but that doesn't, that doesn't take away the responsibility. Uh, and then John A. Ryan, um, speaking um, at the end of some of his most important works, quotes himself several times here when he says, if there are things we can do to make things better, paraphrasing, we have the obligation to try to do those. And I love this. Obviously, we shall make mistakes in the process. But until the attempt is made and a certain and very large number of mistakes are made, there will be no progress. I think um, Sharon Welch talks about um, the, uh, the privileged West, Western person as being in love with an ethic of control. And by that she means, she's a feminist writer, she means I'll try to change things if I can see the goal and I see the steps to the goal and I'll follow the steps to the goal. And I, I'll work really hard for that, but if, if that falls off the rails or if it doesn't work, well then I tried and I give up. And she saw this in the, in the nuclear uh, resistance movement of the 80s. People really were out there and they did so much work and then it didn't get anywhere and they went home to the suburbs and they just made a lot of money and they forgot about all that, right? It's very easy to say I tried, didn't work. And uh, this is where I like Ryan. He says, uh, he, you know, he comes from a farming, working class background. And he says, no, we got to try. We're going to make a whole bunch of mistakes. That's okay. We got to keep going. Okay. All right. So thank you for listening. And I look forward to hearing what you think of all this. Uh, thanks so much for giving me the honor of your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, just to begin with some questions. I'm just thinking of this sense of conversion and those who are converted oftentimes are then seen as radicals or seen as outside of the norm. How do you explain that, especially as college students when there's a lot of peer pressure or as people who are in working in law or working in economics and those kind of fields where there's a lot of pressure to have that strong goal. So how do you explain that conversion to other people? Thank you, that's a great question um, and a tough one, right? Um, I know that I'll often say to my students, I so wish so regularly that being Christian just meant being nice. I really wish that were true, you know, if I, because I'm a nice person, you know, and so <laughs> isn't that enough, right? Um, and what one of the, I was talking about the beauties of a, of a higher education, but one of the difficulties of higher education is it, enculturas, it enculturates us in some deep ways into the status quo. You know, we want to make it in the status quo. We want to be a lawyer. We want to be a, you know, a, a doctor or whatever it might be. So there's no way we're going to escape um, wanting to be part of the, the way things are and not wanting to be that guy or that woman, right, who's always raising, there she goes, she always raises this, you know, why, do, why can't we have vegetarian meals, okay. You know, like being that one person who raises that one issue, right? And so I do think it's a great question because I believe when I take my faith seriously that I do need to be a person of radical dedication to ongoing 
conversion, but that language, as you say, is not language I can use with very many people <laughs> in my workplace, even though I teach in the theology department. Um, and so, so I think you're pointing your finger on, I don't know, people may have other ideas about this, but I think this is where having communities where you really can talk about this stuff, small communities or friendships or family members, I see some people nodding there, that's really key, right? Because um, you won't be understood by the by the status quo. You will be the weird guy, you know, the weird woman, you know, and and so that's for all of us to discern. Like, if I get too off the beaten track, maybe I won't have a job anymore. Is that where I want to go? No. Do I want to keep my job? So then, how do I navigate being true to this sort of thing, even though I can't speak it out loud or do it as wildly as I might want to do, and so forth? I think that's an ongoing challenge. But I'm always very challenged by the poor women, you know, the, the, that were imaged in the scriptures today. Like those folks um, don't get to be, you know, maintain just their comfort. They don't get to say, well, what will people think of me? You know, um, they have to make some pretty radical, risky decisions on a day to day basis because their lives are so precarious. And so there's a courage there that I think we get sort of washed out of us, you know, when we're trained to be in elite professions, even my own, you know. So I think you put your finger on a really hard problem. Others may have insights about that. Or another question or a comment. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for taking a risk. <laughs> yeah, um, hello. I guess I don't really need the mic. Um, maybe I do. Uh, so I wanted to ask you if you could maybe drill down a little bit on the way that Catholic social teaching conceives conceives of the role of the public sector in providing the kinds of, you know, the four S's, et cetera, because, so, you know, personally, um, the two, I'm kind of like new to the United States and the two places I'd lived before coming here were Canada and Denmark, which of course both have very strong public sectors uh, and you know, public sectors that I personally felt very grateful for. And you know, I have to say, I didn't feel terribly tyrannized, but I find that often what these kinds of conversations in at least the United States, as far as I've experienced them tend to hinge around is this question of, granted that we all agree that these are valuable ends, there's a kind of principled opposition to certain things that are, you know, putatively come with the public provision of goods. And so, you know, like inefficiency and coercion and this kind of thing. Um, and so, and you know, especially in the context of the, the biblical narrative, I'm actually writing a paper right now on um, the sabbatical and jubilee years. And of course, you know, in the Hebrew Bible, there's a really a very strong kind of um, permission of, you know, what I guess today might reasonably map onto like coercive kind of like, you know, repossession of assets for the sake of the public good and right, so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so I was wondering, yeah, is there is there a kind of framework within Catholic social teaching granted all of these kind of ends that we discuss in which we can conceive of the proper place of public action and, you know, what's what's too little and is there such a thing as too much and that kind of thing? Well, you've, again, you've laid out a, a, an incredibly important and complicated area extremely well. Thank you. Um, and I think you're so right, and your experience intrigues me, having lived in these other places, is that, again, our culture in the United States has this knee-jerk suspicion of government, right? Um, and I do think it's kind of the yo-yo thing. You know, you're on your own. You know, you're an individual. Um, you know, you should take care of yourself and your family and pull yourself up and so forth and so on. But it's always been somewhat of an illusion, right? Anyone who says I've done it all on my own is really not really telling. They don't, they've narrowed their lens so much that they're missing, starting with all the care work that that kept them from dying when they were a baby up till now and got them into school and when they go home and, and so forth. So we're never on our own. Now you're asking about things like government policies and programs that you see in, in Denmark, healthcare and so forth. And it's fascinating to see that um, CST emerges in a European context, and so it's from the beginning been sort of steeped in a non-American culture of saying, well, of course the government has a role to play here. Of course, if you need health care for people who can't get it, it makes sense to coordinate that through the government. So there's this bias in Catholic social thought, and I think coming out of its own context, that has always rubbed against Catholic uh, American sensibilities, which is one of the reasons Ryan was such an important figure, because he tried so hard to sort of, to sort of um, um, articulate this to an American audience. And he articulated it in terms of 
Everyone has, should have access to a livelihood via work. Um, the government should set things up so that's possible. And he even said early in his career, ideally it should be you get enough money and then you can buy your own health care and you can buy, your, but in reality that's not going to work. So therefore, and he was very connected to the New Deal, you know, he actually, you know, believed that the New Deal was the flowering of his own ideas about what should happen in the United States. And y you, could, you could actually see it. So he was thrilled at the New Deal pro uh, program because it was a move into this more, whatever you want to call it, sharing, redistributive, you know, government support. So, so, and he died in 1945, you know, so we've seen so much happen since then. But yes, a Catholic view presses against this American sensibility. And if you're a Catholic and an American, that is very challenging, right? Um, also because even, as Americans, we don't even like our religion to tell us what to do, right? And so it's kind of like, well, who is the Pope to tell me? I gave a talk at Villanova to, to the Society for Economics and Law, and I thought, I didn't know this, but evidently um, the Society for Economics and Law is an incredibly um, um, sort of orthodox, market orthodoxy group, but I didn't know that coming in. They wanted me to talk about the economics of Pope Francis. <laughs> so I do my spiel and they're staring at me and you know, and you know, it was a classic example of the sort of sneering, eye rolling like, <laughs> You know, of course the Pope's going to say that, but it has nothing to do with reality. You know, like this is completely inaccurate and off the mark and it's never going to work. And so, you know, that's what, but that's the reality that you run into, right? So what we need is highly educated people like all of you who have imbibed some of this and can deploy it in very smart ways, the way John A. Ryan did in 2022, 25, to say, how do we... Our, use this as a tool in our arsenal to argue for something that isn't just yo-yo, you know? Um, and that if, it's, if I'm not just on my own, I've failed somehow, right? Um, it's very different. I see people that might also have experiences from other cultures and other countries around the tables here, you know? That there's different ways of looking at this. And we in the United States, to make it even worse, we think we're always the best. I was raised that way. I'm a post-World War II, you know, raised kid. And I have it in my, my head is so, so framed to say, you can tell me about Denmark. There's something in my head will say, but yeah, there's probably something wrong with that because I, I, I bet it's, I, bet, I think it's still better here. I don't care what you say, you know. You know, I know there's so many problems with those programs, right? Don't tell me, you know. And that, that's ideology, right? <laughs> it's a cultural ideology. So thank you for raising it. Um, thank you so much, Professor. So, so, so here is my question. Like, I, I think what you're talking about, um, at least I get the feeling, is um, about ethical principles. And like, I'm sure most of us here um, all agree with those ethical principles. But like, I would like you to talk a little bit more about how that translates like, into practical wisdom. Mm -hmm. And um, the way I understand it is the church, including uh, Catholic social teaching, has been very cautious in not getting into too specific policy territory, um, because that kind of requires a more specific um, economic expertise that mm -hmm. honestly most of us in this room do not have, right? right? Like to kind of just give a very relevant example, the Build Back Better plan of um, President Biden, there has been heated discussion um, from the left, from the right about inflation versus public provision of goods and this and that. I have been trying to follow it and in the end there's a voice in me that tells me, no, you're not even entitled to an opinion because you do not know these advanced econometric models. You do not know what is the math involved. You do not know what is the supply and the demand. So it's like, okay, we have all these principles, but um, um, in what way can they really kind of inform us um, into really practical wisdom in thinking about policy, voting for policy, or even designing policy if we were to go in that direction. Yeah, thank you. What a wonderful, what a wonderful question. And again, incredibly so well articulated. Thank you. Um, first of all, when you said I don't even have the right to a to an opinion, that's a really important important point you're pointing on. And I think. Um, rather than thinking of these as like principles over here and then like the world is going on over here, the world is going on over here, the Build Back Better, you know, all the fighting, based on sets of principles. 
<laughs> you know, it's not like here we have the principles, these guys do, you know, but they have principles. They are always articulated, right? Uh, a principle like, you know, the greatest amount of production is going to bring the greatest amount of good for people. You know, if you curtail production, it's going to hurt people. And so they, uh, principles or, or normative beliefs, at least, you know, um, they aren't just empirical beliefs. And so part of the job, I think, is to, um, f is to be able to, in our own small lives, but also as we talk about policy or, or if we're in those positions, to recognize that there are always principles at stake. There are always views of what the economy is for at stake, but they aren't articulated. And so I don't need to be an expert in econometrics to say, what should the economy be for? What should work be for? Um, and to say it should be for people. Now that's actually seems very simplistic. It's I could put it on a banner, I could walk around, you know, with, with the Greta Thunberg, you know, with it. And so it seems like the guys in Villanova could roll their eyes at that and say, oh please, right? So that's the challenge, right? How do you in your fields of expertise uh, marshal your expertise, but also interpolate or inter, 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 integrate this set of values, this set of principles, and speak in your field in language that those folks can understand, right? And that is not easy. That is a challenging thing to do. So that's the more larger thing, but then there's the more how in real life does this work in terms of practical wisdom. I do think that the family, the home, the everyday life of individuals, tell its people, no, you shouldn't be buying a big SUV. <laughs> you know? um, like you should feel embarrassed to drive into the parking lot in that huge SUV if you don't have six, eight kids in the back, right? Um, it, like we're too scared you know, to, to tell people on the level of social and economic that there's certain things really you should be examining your conscience about. We're quick to say abortion, you know, sexual ethics and so forth, but this we tiptoe around, right? Is it because we need their money? You know, like, what is it? You know, or uh, they need our money, whatever. But, but there's such an unmined, untapped resource in our communities, in our parish communities, our small Christian communities, for, for bringing this into reality in your own life, or struggling with it at least. And then you add that, then that becomes more credibility for when you want to talk about that in the more public realm. Um, but we need people who have the guts, you know, to try to, something different. And again, I know how shaped and scarred I am by the way I've been raised to not want to rock the boat, you know, to not want to do anything different, you know. Um, so that's not a really helpful answer, but it's the beginnings of a conversation. Thank you, though. It's a huge problem, issue. Five more minutes. <laughs> So I just want to say the previous question was fantastic. Yeah. I really like that one. So I, I come from two countries where there have been revolutions. And um, the revolutions have been organized by uh, men who wanted to make the country better. The problem is that just because you want to make it better doesn't mean you actually make it better. You need to have a plan of action. And I think that it kind of connects back to your question. Mm -hmm. And I worry sometimes that we say, okay, we, we, need, we should be more like this, or we should do this, but because we don't have a way of doing it, mm -hmm. we end up taking routes that actually damage us more. And I just want to give a quick example. Uh, there was a, I forget the country, I think it might have been India, mm -hmm. where they said, there's too many snakes, that they're killing children and, and people, let's catch them, let's kill them, and that way we save lives. So they, they began doing that. We, they ended up with more snakes, and that was because some people found out that if they could breed snakes and then give them to the government, they would make money. Mm -hmm. So you ended up with more snakes than you started with. Mm -hmm. So that, and this is where I want to relate it back to the topic here. You, you've laid out some moral values, but how do we apply them in a way that works so that we don't actually end up damaging more people like has happened in my two countries? Exactly. Thank you very much for raising that. Such a, so important. And this, here we have the fallibility of the human condition, right? I can have great, great ideals and great plans, and even a pretty good plan, right? But the plan can go awry. Like the snake thing, that was a plan, right? But the plan went awry. And this is where, and this is what um, Lonergan will talk about, human, sort of the ongoing self-correcting nature of human consciousness, of human endeavor. In other words, and this goes back to Ryan saying, we're going to make a lot of mistakes. 
Uh, and then when we make the mistake, we should treat it like the, like the scientific method. Okay, that's new data. We got to go back and back to the drawing board and try something different. Now, it's a rare person, it's a rare group who is in the position to exercise that, right? Like in the United States, if I was the snake guy, I got elected on the snake, you know, uh, the snake uh, platform and everything went around, you'd vote me out, right? <laughs> and so like even having a community that can continue to work on this stuff over time is a challenge. So again, when I hear what you're saying, um, one answer to me that I jump to is, well, yeah, no matter what you do, it's going to fall apart, right? Um, and, that, that's, and I know you weren't saying that, but it's like that's one way you could go, right? Or um, what we really need are technocrats in a good sense, like people who know what they're doing, engineers who know how to do, get us from A to B. And, and this tradition is very big on the best of scientific and practical knowledge, saying we don't just need people with values, we need engineers, we need doctors, we need politicians who are smart and not stupid. You know, we need all these people to give their absolute best uh, to trying to figure out what to do, you know, at the next stage of the snake crisis, right? And so, but it's an ongoing, messy, you know, um, frustrating, go forward, step back, go forward, step back. But that's when it's important to remember that things really do change. You know, things really do, can really get better. And so, so you know, I guess I, maybe I'm talking out of two sides of my mouth. On the one hand, you need the expertise of people who actually do know how to run a government, et cetera. And that's why so many utopic views have failed, right? Or become totalitarian, right? The last thing I want to say is you're pointing out human fallibility and human sinfulness as well. We're selfish. We do want to care for, we do take care of number one, you know? And so all this, I'm related to other people, that all sounds great, but how do we continue to um, work practically and smartly? I thought of, you know, wise as, a, wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove in the scriptures, right? Like how do we work smart to incentivize people. This is where behavioral economics is very interesting right now, about incentivizing people to do the right thing um, through various economic policies. Uh, because we don't, we're very fallible and we're also selfish, you know, and so how do you, how do you control for that as you set up your policies? You can't just go by ideals or, or values. You've gotta be, you've gotta be practical. Again, I, I have no answers. <laughs> That's just the beginning of a response, but thank you. Looks like it's seven. We have one more minute. I think we should. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Quick question then. Um, hopefully. Uh, so thank you for talking about it. But uh, in the back of my mind, it seems like it's a lot easier for a lot of us, at least, to like say yes, the SUV, or like maybe I can spend less of my money on this, like you know, <laughs> personal lux uh, luxuries versus whatever. But how does this apply to things like power and prestige and like when is enough enough of those other things? And like going back to your last point where you said we need everyone giving their best, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's very hard, especially here, to determine like when your best is like, okay, another ladder to climb for the sake of climbing a ladder versus climbing a ladder because you can actually do more from the top of the ladder than right. down. Like, so how do you think about it from that perspective? Yeah, yeah. when I'm at a Jesuit school and we, and the Jesuit tradition, Ignatian tradition talks a lot about this, the magis, like, you know, being the best, giving the best, doing more, giving more, and uh, they went into education 500 years ago because they wanted to educate the elite so they could be the great, the best leaders for the sake of the common good, right? So, and that's kind of where we find ourselves. Um, so I would say that the question is always, what's driving what? Right, and that's, you know, for Ignatian spirituality, you ask that question every day. You do an examination of conscious every day and say like, where was I pulled, you know? Like, what kind of one? You know, my own ambition or like, I'm doing this for the sake of, and, and it's, it's, a, it's living in this state of constant kind of self-questioning and uncertainty a bit, you know, to say, uh, I realize that I can fall into selfishness and self-aggrandizing, but do I not take this honor because it's too, you know, I, I, it's being too flashy, but maybe this honor can allow me to do X, Y, and Z. So you're, again, you're pointing, you're pointing at power, prestige, those sorts of things, um, ability to do stuff in the world. Um, but because we're so fallible, we need communities to, to hold us in check. We need spiritual practices. We need examinations of consciousness and so forth and so on, which is part of the rich tradition of religious traditions, You know, uh, the rich um, treasures that we can draw on. Too little known by too many people. But thank you so much.
Dr. Ferrihansis, thank you so much for your insights on Catholic social teaching, inclusive economics, and how we can become radicals in the best way possible. I also want to thank all of you for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you in person or via live stream for our final lecture of the semester on December 5th, where Dr. Adam Idle will provide his reflections for the Catholic faculty series, Life as a Scholar and Believer. Thanks, and have a good evening. <laughs>